Airsoft's foray into the CD-based era was a veritable success. Final Fantasy VII shattered sales records on both coasts, selling an astounding 2.3 million copies within three days of its Japanese release, and an additional 330,000 later that year in America. For the first time ever, Final Fantasy was a mainstream fixture in the gaming world. Seven's departure from the series' signature conventions was originally perceived as risque. The game skated between elements of the past and present with adventurous new changes in system mechanics and story direction. In the end, those very tweaks were paramount to Seven's success. When Square knew it had a hit on its hands, the company began production on number eight the very same year, during Seven's localization in the US. The series had to evolve even further, like no other in the franchise. Final Fantasy VIII was released in Japan on February 11, 1999, September 7 in the States. Development had run continuously for nearly two years. Sakaguchi graced the project once more as the executive producer, while Kitase, Nomura, and Uematsu reprised their respective roles. The experience that Square gained during the production of Seven bolstered its understanding of the PlayStation hardware's capabilities. With this knowledge in hand, Kitase envisioned the next game sporting a more realistic look, and with Nomura's encouragement, a school day's aesthetic similar to popular Japanese dramas and animes airing at the time. With this came realistically proportioned character models, the first the series had ever seen. And the ballad of Squall Leonhardt and Renoa Harley. Final Fantasies typically put you in the company of rogues, rebels, and mercenaries, but Eight established players as one of the trainees of Balam Garden, a military academy managed by the watchful eye of Headmaster Sid. Squall, an introverted gunblade specialist, was one of the school's most promising students. On the day of his graduation exam, he was contracted by the State of Delay to repel the forces of the invading Galbadian Empire, along with fellow trainees Zell, a hot-headed brawler, Selfie, a cheerful nunchaku master, Cypher, a rebellious upperclassman, and Quistus, Squall's instructor. Squall's Galbadian encounter was the first of many. He eventually found himself under the commission of Renoa, the spirited leader of an upstart rebellion group. Together, they become inextricably linked to the fate of Galbadia's leader, Sorceress Adia. A later objective called upon Squall and his unit, headlined by the romantic rifleman Irvine, to assassinate the Sorceress. But when the plan goes awry, a plentitude of truths open themselves to Squall, prompting him to abandon all preconceived notions of the mission and his duty. Sorceress from the future, Ultimicia, was revealed as the true culprit, manipulating time itself in a bid to unite her dimension with the past. Together with his companions, Squall ventured into the den of the lion to restore order to the world and protect the ones dear to his heart. Final Fantasy VIII made bold new strokes in story and narration. The theme of love had always played a part in side stories prior, but for the first time, it was brought into the foreground as the main motivator for the protagonist's actions. It was, for all intents and purposes, a love story, with its cast of characters taking respective roles amid webs of tangled relationships. It was also the first Final Fantasy that delved into different frames of mind, from the internal narrative of Squall's thoughts to a side quest set in a completely different place and time. The realistic tone was made immediately clear by the opening score, an orchestral piece accompanied by a Latin choir and breathtaking full motion video. Along with the game's title theme song, Eyes On Me, sung by Chinese pop star Fei Wong, 8 was the first of the series to feature lyrical scores. The boundaries that had separated Final Fantasy from other mediums of popular expression, like movies and music, had been broken. Eyes On Me later became a single that went on to sell 400,000 copies in Japan. One of Squall's first outings pitted him against the fiery Ifrit, who wasn't known as a summon or esper, but as a GF, or guardian force. When these magical beasts were bested in combat, they became permanent additions to your party that could be equipped. GFs were powerful allies you could summon in battle, but outside of combat was where they were most useful, in the form of junctioning, 
the central feature of 8. Rather than pulling on armor with predetermined stats, players could assign magic siphoned from enemies, an action called drawing, and equip them to specific stats and attributes. Junctioning allowed for a great deal of customization and flexibility, bequeathing players all the elemental and status effect spells of the series at their beck and call. Apart from the radical changes in magic and summons, the combat structure, for the most part, resembled the three-man active time battles from Seven. Each of the character's limit breaks, however, shed Seven's limit bar and returned to the rare desperation moves from Final Fantasy VI. Squall, like Cyan before him, pulled off a series of blade strikes timed by the R1 trigger, while Zell utilized the spiritual successor of Sabin's blitz attacks. Weapons were no longer bought but upgraded, which took various parts collected in battle and used them in a crafting process. In addition, cars, trains, and shuttles comprised a large number of transportation options, although airships, flying fortresses, and the ubiquitous chocobo also made appearances. The chocobo was also featured in a minigame tie-in using the pocket station. The code to power it still exists in the North American release, but the peripheral never made it across the Pacific. One of Final Fantasy VIII's biggest side features was Triple Triad, a robust minigame that took place on a grid with numbered cards. Though not necessary, it was an interesting and rich diversion that awarded players persistent enough to play it. Determined card sharks could net Squall's legendary weapon, the Lionheart, with enough diligence. Riding the hype of its predecessor, Final Fantasy VIII's release in 1999 beat previous records set with 2.4 million copies sold in Japan, and in America, it became the best-selling game for three weeks after its debut in September. Critically, however, the game was received with mixed reactions. Most players and critics felt that the junctioning system was flawed and needlessly complicated, longing for the user-friendliness of Seven's materia. Drawing magic from enemies was also cited as a repetitive task. Conversely, some embraced Eight's bold system changes. Its storytelling remains amongst the most compelling the series has seen, and its following is one of the largest across the worldwide fanbase. Many speculated the next game in the series would go above and beyond the modern realism of Eight and into the realm of the future. It ultimately became a fond look at the past. As the last Final Fantasy on the original PlayStation, Sakaguchi wanted it to be an adequate reflection on the series thus far. The concept they would end up using wasn't originally intended to be a part of the core franchise. While its early development began alongside 8, the plan was to release the game as an addendum so as not to conflict with the newer futuristic direction the series was heading for. In 1999, it was announced that the yet untitled project would indeed receive a Roman numeral. It was slated to come out in early 2000, but Square's biggest competitor, Enix, had just finished Dragon Quest VII. Square delayed its latest effort several months to avoid a simultaneous release. They used the time for another marketing push of action figures and Coca-Cola commercials. These showed its next Final Fantasy would be both a striking departure and a faithful homage to the eight games that preceded it. Final Fantasy IX was released in Japan on July 7, 2000. It arrived in America in mid-November. In addition to his production role, Hironobu Sakaguchi returned to the creative staff to help solidify early concepts. He was aided by game producer Shinji Hashimoto. Yoshitaka Amano also returned to the forefront of the team. Nobuo Uematsu composed his ninth continuous score, and in the director's chair was Hiroyuki Ito, responsible for such Final Fantasy pillars as the job in active time battle systems and espers. Almost every aspect of the design in Nine returned to the roots of the series. The plot appeared to follow many common cliches, but it was intended to. The adventure began when our hero, Zidane, a member of a rogue theater group, took part in an elaborate attempt to kidnap the Princess Garnet. As they bumbled their way through the mission, they were accidentally joined by Garnet's stalwart protector, Steiner, and the befuddled black mage, Vivi. Through the trials that followed, they enlisted the talents of the stoic dragoon Freya, the effervescent summoner Iko, the enigmatic gourmand Quina, and the brooding bounty hunter Amarant. They also got occasional assistance from Beatrix, a general to the army of Alexandria, and various members of Tantalus, Zidane's performing pals. Mm -hmm. 
Sid got promoted to a royal position in Nine as the regent and ruler of Lindblom. He appeared to the party in Oglop form after being cursed by his wife Hilda. Sid revealed he was the one who ordered Tantalus to kidnap the princess to protect her from the unexplained actions of her mother, Queen Braun. The squad engineer helped the party board the Blue Narciss when both of their airships barely made it back to the ground in one piece. The team took back the skies on Sid's latest invention, the Hildegard III, and even stole the enemy's craft, the Invincible. They also traveled by air trolley and even underground spider in two ancient transit systems called the Gargan and Fossil Roo. The plot in Nine was not only filled with numerous references to the two sprite generations, it almost felt like a direct sequel to the original NES adventure. It was revealed the story's fatalistic villain Kuja came from another world called Terra. To reach this dimension and discover its secrets, you had to travel to four elemental shrines. Their protectors, Malarus, Tiamat, Kraken, and Lich, are unmistakable allusions to the fiends from Final Fantasy I. Even the time-traveling antagonist from the first game made a comeback, as a Darth Vader-esque Garland was unmasked as the architect of the world's demise. His dreamlike realm was called Pandemonium, which was the Emperor's end zone in Final Fantasy II. Crystals also returned, and their themes were fused with the series' first mention of Gaia as the name of the planet. Nine primarily dealt with its lead characters battling with issues of identity. Garnet had the weight of a kingdom on her inexperienced shoulders, and Vivi came to terms with his own creation and inevitable death. Even Kuja wrestles with intense feelings of powerlessness. In addition to conceptual reference, there are also many specific nods to its predecessors. Hilda bears a resemblance to the Final Fantasy II Queen, Dagger dons a white mage's robe, the dwarves shout out a somewhat familiar greeting, the battle line went back to four, and you could attempt to buy a number of classic trinkets at the Traino auction house, such as Yuna's mirror. The ability system in 9 was considerably streamlined in comparison to the complexities of 8, and reflected the systems Ito had previously implemented. Much like with Esper's, characters in 9 learned their abilities by equipping some sort of item that accrued ability points per battle. Once the skills were learned, the item could be swapped out and the character would still be able to use the ability. Any equipment slot now had the capacity to teach these talents, and they became usable by the character the moment the item was assigned. Items taught different characters varied abilities. Much like Final Fantasy IV, each hero in Nine was clearly intended for a particular job. Their personal traits reflected these roles. Some were shared by multiple characters, and some were unique. In addition, not all the abilities could be active at once, allowing the player to be more or less effective by assembling the proper combination of attributes for each upcoming task. The Limit Break concept from Seven made a comeback when party members entered trance mode by reaching the end of their damage bar. Zidane was the only warrior who could choose from a list of attacks while tranced, as the others received a brief boost, strengthening their attack power or allowing them to act more than once. Unlike Limit Breaks, these bonuses couldn't be saved and carried over to another encounter. Summons were dubbed Eidolons in Nine, and their callers originated from a lost village, similar to Rydia's hometown in Four. Replicating 8's grid-based card diversion, 9 let you challenge multiple characters to a bout of Tetramaster. Unlike 8, the game within a game became a necessary objective that pit you against the sport's champion, Sailor Aaron. After you became the new Tetramaster, Aaron was revealed as the pilot of your first airship. Nine also introduced the Final Fantasy audience to a strange internet support system called Play Online. Originally conceived to interact with Final Fantasy X, Play Online developed into an online add-on for Brady Games Strategy Guide. This proved to be a poorly thought-out idea. Many fans that purchased it felt cheated because of the lack of printed information. Today, Play Online serves as the communication hub for Square's internet services, including Final Fantasy XI and Tetramaster. Although Nine received critical acclaim, it was faced with mixed feelings from fans. While elder players looked upon it with warm nostalgia, the younger set simply didn't get it. 
Nevertheless, Sakaguchi has stated several times that Final Fantasy IX is his personal favorite. Join us next week when the faces of Square's fantasies are finally given a voice. You... you understand me? And the only direct console sequel in the franchise makes its mark.